saying welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not really sure how this got here, but I just want to make an announcement of it because I found it in the building, and so somebody must have been here and dropped it in there. There is a opportunity coming up for anyone interested. This used to be actually my passion many, many years ago. The state police are getting ready to hire, and they're having a test on April 10th, 2022, if I recall in, in days when I was interested in this, you had to go to Albany to take the test. I think that's still the case. I posted one of these up um, downstairs on the bulletin board, along with a contact trooper that's res responsible for recruiting. The state police, when I was looking at state police, I was a deputy sheriff, part-time deputy sheriff, the salary was $20,000 a year. It is now starting at $58,443, and you make $82,677 after one year of service. So it's, uh, things have changed a lot, but a great opportunity if anyone's interested in that, uh, as long as you just stay in this community, you're fine. Now, <laughs> just be aware of this. It is posted on the bulletin board downstairs. If this is something that interests you, or you know a, a young man or woman who might be interested in this, uh, it's a, uh, an interesting career, a lot of good, good, lot of good people in, in, that, uh, in that work. So just be aware of that. Um, Susan was talking to me a little while ago, and I think what we're going to do pretty soon is we're going to start putting together another, if you will, um, worship service order and announcements in some kind of a uh, little, you know, might be a single or, a, or a folding sheet so we can put uh, announcements on there so people can have something they can actually take home. Uh, a lot of things are coming up. We've got Bible studies on Friday, uh, some other programs that uh, Susan's going to be talking about next week. So a lot of opportunities. So we want to start putting things where people can have them and not say, well, gee, what did Chris say, you know, last week? And so we'll, we'll start doing that pretty soon. But welcome as we come to worship in a time when, you know, you thought everything was going crazy before, inflation and all these things, and now what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, um, the, the ramifications, sometimes we just get too comfortable. And we just, well, it's not us, it's not us. Um, boy, I tell you what, uh, we're in dangerous times. And uh, the Lord is in control. I'm confident of that. The Lord is going to use this for his purpose. But as I've said before, it might be a wake-up call for believers to start getting our act together. You, you know that verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. That's, um, it starts here. And we need to be serious about that. Um, I have had amazing opportunities to be in Russia on numerous occasions and uh, actually was able to go to a, a Christian church in Russia, in Moscow, a uh, neat gathering of believers. And I'll tell you what, talk about the neat fellowship. I'm there. And after the service, four different Russians came up to me and said, uh, you know, how are you? And introduced themselves, made me feel, feel very uh, welcome. And I said, okay, it, you know, I had to take a few subways and I had to, you know, do all sorts of things to get here. I don't really remember how to get back to my hotel. It's not far from the Kremlin. Can you point me in the right direction? They said, oh, we'll go with you. And they spent about four hours with me, walking me around. We had lunch together, uh, and they were just, just so open-hearted. And I, I'll never forget, we're, we're sitting around the table, and I'm, I'm saying to each one of them, tell me, how did you come to Christ? When, when did you put your faith in Christ? And, and the first three are telling me their story about how they came to Christ and put their faith in Christ. And then I get to the fourth one. I said, and in you, what, what's, what's your story? And he said, I don't have a story just yet. He says, I've been just going to this church trying to figure out what I should be. <laughs> and it was just neat because he was a seeker going there. And here he was joining these, these three solid believers that were wanting to take And by the way, he was just as hospitable as all of them. And it was just neat to see God working in a place that before that, you know, Christianity was, you know, just don't even talk about it. You know, There's a lot of underground churches in Russia. But now they were, if you will, in the open as much as they could be and on fire for the Lord. And that's, ex that's exciting. I want to open with a, a call to worship, if you will, from, from Philippians. It's some neat verses from chapter 3, excuse me, from chapter 4. Beginning in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. 
I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Are you anxious? Is there a lot of things going on in your mind? I have to be honest, I was up since 4 o'clock this morning. All these things that are going on that I'm trying to deal with and things like that, and I was just praying, Lord, I just need some more sleep. <laughs> Let me go back to sleep. And uh, you know, all those things in there. And, and we're called to rejoice. Not, not to say, oh, this is wrong and this is wrong. Rejoice. Because God is going to use even those tough circumstances in our lives to do something amazing. So let's, if you're able to, please let's stand as we sing and welcome each other in Jesus' name. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
the music just ties into what we're thinking about. Um, I want to spend some time. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we need you. We, we need you, Lord, to touch our lives and our hearts and work through us and work in us. Almighty God, we consider what's happening right now in Europe with Ukraine and Russia. And Lord, I have been told by a number of people in the missionary field that I know that in Ukraine there is a strong contingent of Christians. Those that have been going and reaching out to Russia and the surrounding areas with the, with the gospel message. Lord God Almighty, they must be wondering where you are. But Lord, they, like we know that you are there, we don't know your timing, we don't know your plan, but you are good, and you are faithful, and you will use all these things for your purposes. Almighty God, I pray that you might provide a Gideon moment, that though the Ukrainians are outnumbered and, and outmanned, that, Lord, you might really show up, that no one will credit humans with victory, but that they will see that something supernatural has happened and that, Lord, people will see you in their midst. Almighty God, I pray for wisdom for the, the leaders in Europe, the leaders in America, the leaders in Ukraine, and, yes, even the leaders in Russia, that you might wake us all up to your glory and your promise. Almighty God, help us individually to pray daily for the war and the strife that it might come to an end and that the peace that passes understanding might come. Almighty God, I continue to think of those in our midst as well as those that we know of Becky Arcady, for instance, in her uh, ongoing treatment for breast cancer. Almighty God, bring healing there. For, for Alan in his recent episodes with, uh, with seizure, Almighty God, just be with him and, and, and take those away. I, I thank you, Almighty God, that when it happened, you made sure that there was people with him at the time. Thank you for, for your, your foreknowledge and how you prepare. Almighty God, for anyone here that is hurting, that is struggling in relationships or with health, Almighty God, may your touch be with them. And Lord, now I pray that you will be with us as we look into your word. I pray, Almighty God, that you'll speak to me and that you'll speak through me. I pray, Almighty God, that we will see you and your grace. And these things we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this is going to be an, an interesting time because I'm, um, we're, we're finishing up in our look at the book of Judges that we started five weeks ago. Last week, uh, John Bransford um, filled in for me while I was in Pennsylvania to celebrate a granddaughter's birthday. Um, and so I wanted to, to, to try to button up our discussion and look at Judges by looking at the, one of the judges, there was three judges that got the most ink. Uh, that would have been Deborah, that would have been Gideon, we talked about them in the past, and, and now Samson. They, again, they got the most ink in the Bible relative to the story of judges. And, and if you've heard the story of Samson, you may have a vision of some muscle-bound giant of a man, or, or perhaps a righteous hero. A person that, that just exuded goodness. 
Um, but the truth about Samson is, is very different. The story of Samson begins in chapter 13 of the book of Judges, and it, and it chronicles his birth, and then almost immediately goes to the actions of Samson. Judges chapter 13, verses 2 through 5, and by the way, we are going to go through a, a scripture reading that's going to take us somewhere that you wouldn't expect, but I'm just going to use a couple verses to set the stage. So chapter 13, verses 2 through 5, says that a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are st sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Manoah's wife goes to Manoah and tells him about this strange encounter she had because Manoah wasn't with her at the time. And he prayed that the angel of the Lord will return and teach them how to raise this promised child. He, he wanted instruction. What, you know, if this child is set apart for God, I, I really need to understand what do we need to do. And so surely he returns, the angel of the Lord, which later we realize is what I call the Christophany, we talked about in the past, where he's actually revealed that it is God. God, if you will, in the flesh, a, a pre-incarnate visitation of God. And so when Manoah asked him that question, what she must do, he, he, he said to Manoah and his wife, she must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, or eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. So he's kind of reiterating what he told Manoah's wife, and also saying, hey, you can't even eat anything that comes from the grapes. No raisins. <laughs> All that stuff you got, you got to stay with, because he is a Nazarite set apart to God. And with this command, there are some actions that take place. They, they want to prepare a goat for him and things like that. And it was during those, those follow-up actions with the angel of the Lord that it is revealed that it was indeed God in the flesh, if you will. And the next thing we learn as we continue in the book of Judges chapter 13 is says that the woman gave birth. She's not given a name, by the way. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he was at Mahadan, between Zorah and Eshtol. And we learn nothing about his childhood. He's born, and then the Spirit comes on him, and he takes action. God blessed him, and then God moved in him when the time was right. Exactly when God was ready to, to, to start using him for his purposes, that was the time that was right. God chose Samson. Samson didn't earn it. His parents didn't do anything incredible that would say, boy, your, your kid's got to be special. There was nothing in his family heritage as the tribe of Dan that would set him apart as an individual. God set him apart from birth. And, and when I was reading that, considering that, two verses came to mind when I considered Samson. The first one's from Jeremiah chapter 1. And Jeremiah is told by God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You know, God is involved intimately even before we're born. And in Jeremiah's case, he said, I've got a plan for him. This is what he's going to do. Even though Jeremiah said, who am I? I? I don't have it all. What about Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30? For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. God knows the path that you will take because he foreknew it. He, he knew the decisions you would make. And God is working in your life even when you don't realize it to do something great. Amazing as it sounds, God knew you and I before we were born. B before we were even a twinkle in our parents' eye, God knew the direction that our lives would take. One of my famous digressions, that, that's the thing that amazes me about 
to the creation of Adam and Eve, God knew that they would choose disobedience, yet he still created them. And God knew that he had to do something to redeem them. And before the foundation of the world, we're told in the scripture, God had a plan for redemption. If, if, if you knew that the child that you were going to deliver was going to end up being a mass murderer, what might you do? God loves his creation. He knows the direction they're going to take, yet he says, I still am going to allow this to happen. I'm going to use circumstance. I'm going to use situation. I'm going to bring more and more people to myself. He knows the choices that you and I will make. And quite frankly, he knows even those bad choices. Yet he will use those bad choices to speak into our lives. And God knows the choice that we will make for the most important decision we'll ever make. Do you recognize that Jesus Christ died for you? Do, do you believe that, that God is real and that God cares for you and that God loves you. Will, will you trust God's promise of redemption to those who believe? One of my favorite verses, John 1, 12, yet to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, to believe and receive. The verse that everyone knows, John three sixteen, actually verse 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. And 17 continues, um, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Lastly, Romans 10, 9 through 11. Verses that were used to get me on the path towards seeking after God. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. doesn't say you may be saved. You might be saved. You will be saved. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Samson was set apart to God by God. And he would be the next judge that, that God would use to answer Israel's cry for deliverance at this time from the Philistines. As you, as you recall, God turned them over different times to their enemies because of their disobedience and that they forsook God and then they would cry out to God and God would deliver them through a judge. But before we go too far, I need to lay an important foundation that will lead us into our scripture verses for today that's not going to be in the book of Judges but in the book of Numbers because in the book of Judges, we learn that Samson is set apart from birth to be a Nazarite. And, and what is this idea of a Nazarite? What does it mean to be set apart as a Nazarite? What, what, are the, what are the requirements? What are the expectations? So I think the background is critical for us to understand Samson and his relationship with God. So if you will, we will have it on the screen, but if you want to look at the separate scriptures in the Pew Bible or your own copy of scriptures, Numbers chapter 6 verses 1 through 21. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. It reads, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man or a woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord as a Nazarite, he or she must abstain from wine or other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or from other, any other fermented drink. He or she must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as he or she is a Nazarite, he or she must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins. During the entire period of his vow of separation, no razor may be used on his head. He must be holy until the period of separation to the Lord is over. He must let his hair grow on his head, his, the hair on his head grow long. Throughout the period of his separation to the Lord, he must go, not go near a dead body. Even if his own father or mother or brother or sister dies, he must not make himself ceremonially unclean on account of them. Because the symbol of his separation to God is on his head. Throughout the period of his separation, he is consecrated to the Lord. If someone dies suddenly in his presence, thus defiling the hair he has dedicated, he must shave his head on the day of his cleansing. The seventh day. Then on the eighth day, he must bring two doves and two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. 
the priest is to offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to make atonement for him because he sinned by being in the presence of a dead body. That same day he is to consecrate his head. He must dedicate himself to the Lord for a period of his separation and must bring a year-old lamb, male lamb, as a guilt offering. The previous days do not count because he became defiled during his separation. Now this is the law for the Nazarite. When the period of his separation is over, he is to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. There he is to present his offering to the Lord, a year-old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year-old ewe lamb without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a fellowship offering, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and a basket of bread made without yeast cakes, cakes made with fine flour mixed with oil, and wafers spread with oil. The priest is to present them before the Lord and make a sin offering and a burnt offering. He is to present the basket of unleavened bread and is to sacrifice the ram as a fellowship offering to the Lord, together with its grain offering and drink offering. Then at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the Nazarite must shave his hair off that he dedicated. He is to take the hair and put it on the fire that is under the sacrifice of the fellowship offering. After the Nazarite has shaved off his hair of dedication, the priest is to place in his hands is placed in his hands a boiled shoulder of the ram and a cake and a wafer from the basket, both made without yeast. The priest shall then wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. They are holy and belong to the priest, together with the breast that was waved and the thigh that was presented. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite, who vows his offering to the Lord in accordance with his separation. In addition to whatever else he can afford, he must fulfill the vow he has made according to the law of the Nazarite. I, I want to point out, and you might have caught it in the very beginning, that it said male or female. Male or female could be separated to God. Then the text continues in, in mainly using masculine terms, but right up front it says male or female could be separated to God as a Nazarite, and these were the rules for the, do, to do that. And quite frankly, that was a lot to digest. It, it goes in a lot of different areas and can be confusing and things like that. And it's quite frankly, to, to, to do an expository on all of that that we just read in Numbers would be would too much for a Sunday. But my desire is to connect the rules of a Nazarite vow as we consider Samson and his final demise, which many of you are aware of. You, you may recall that when we started our look at the book of Judges some four weeks ago, I suggested that in many ways the actions of Israel during this 400-year period of judges is really a mirror for America. This, this idea that, that Israel would honor God for a period of time only to be entrenched with the, the godless nations around them and start to sacrifice to their gods and honor their gods, they would forsake God. Honor God only to forsake God. And Judges illustrates or, or documents a, a series of seven cycles in which the people would honor God, forget God, seek God, and God would, would answer. In His grace and mercy, God would raise up judges even when He had used the enemies around them in order to judge Israel for what they were doing, forsaking God. And, and, and it was when they were forsaking God and then struggling against their enemies that they realized they needed God. And it was only when, they, when times were tough and they realized they couldn't do it on their own, that they needed God, that they would cry out to Him to receive God's grace and mercy. So, so their sin of forsaking God would, would lead them into this period of, of servitude to others around them. That was which, which would lead to their cries of deliverance. They would, they would make supplication before God, at which time God would raise up a judge which would silence the enemy and bring them peace for a time. And if you recall, two weeks ago, the times that they were under their enemy's rule was more than compensated for the time that they were given peace. It was always more times of peace than it was times of oppression. God's grace is amazing, even when he knows people are going to fall right back. And quite frankly, that cycle that Israel went through seems to be human nature. 
we often don't see our need for God until times are tough. When things are going well and the paycheck's coming in, you know, it's a, eat, drink, and be merry. When, when struggles happen, that's all we're, we start asking questions about why and, and, and why now. And so God is trying to reach us and allows those tough times in order to, to get us back to him. Because otherwise we put God on a shelf. <clears throat> or some might say we put the genie back in the bottle. Our prayer times are largely what I want. Give me, give me, give me. And God's not a genie in the bottle. We tend to go back to old habits when we don't think we need God. As I've been praying and talking about earlier, consider what's happening in Europe right now. I've talked about before, remember 9-11, 2001. The week after 9-11, churches were packed with people praying at night. Three weeks later, four weeks later, five weeks later, the churches are empty again. Oh, I guess that's not so bad. I guess, I guess it really wasn't that bad. We, we forget we forget God. Does what's happening in Europe, does what's happening in America now get your attention? Or do you just say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll make it through here. That, you know, I'll try to drive a little bit less because gas is getting more expensive. Or are we seeking after God? Are we asking God to reveal himself to us that we might be part of the change? Now, consider Samson. Israel is one thing that's a mirror for God, for mirror for America. Samson is, is even a more direct illustration of the reality of our sinful nature. Samson, set apart for God, yet he struggled with sin. He struggled with defiance. Set apart to God, his, his lifestyle and his look were supposed to stand out. Never cutting his hair. Not drinking wine when, quite frankly, that's what everybody did. Vineyards all around Israel. Grape juice was, and fermented, and non-fermented would be common, but he couldn't touch it. That stood out. That looked, that looked different to people. And yet his very nature was often rebellious to God, dishonoring the commands that God gave him. For example, the Hebrew people were not supposed to marry outside of the people of Israel. Yet, we find later as we continue looking at Samson that he chose a Philistine woman that he saw that he wanted to be his wife. A Jew, very specifically a Nazareth, was never to have contact with a dead body. But as Samson is going to, to collect on this woman that he wants to marry, he is attacked by a lion. He kills the lion. And some days later, as he's passing by the same path, he sees the decomposing lion there with a beehive in it, and honey had been produced, so some time had passed, and what did he do? He reached in, he scooped up the honey, ate some of the honey, and then later gave some to his parents, but never said it was from a dead body, which the Jews are not supposed to be near. It's, it makes them unclean. Samson later slept with a prostitute and later fell in love with another Philistine by the name of Delilah. If you've seen any of the movies and things like that, you know, you know that name. And in both cases, the woman, the women that Samson aligned himself with led him to compromise and, and put himself in dangerous positions. He, he started to, to listen to them rather than listen to God. By the way, that's a reminder to us. If you, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the scripture says don't be unequally yoked. It doesn't mean don't have friends that are non-believers. Quite frankly, have friends that are non-believers because you can be a witness to them and they can, they can see Christ in you. But don't marry a non-believer because in the most important things in your life, you'll disagree. Samson compromised. Samson put himself in Bad situations. He, Samson put himself in places where temptation would, would be there. Although the text does not say it, and I tend not to believe it, some say or some believe that Samson also violated that requirement to stay away from fermented drink or fruit of the vine because Samson held a seven-day feast as part of their marriage process and 
we know that those seven-day feasts were, quite frankly, drinking binges. The wine would flow and things like that. So perhaps, we don't know, perhaps, the Bible doesn't say he did, but perhaps he partook in that seven-day drinking binge. But if nothing else, he put himself around all the things that would tempt him. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's drinking. Hey, here's some grape juice that's not fermented. Drink that. He, he put himself in a bad situation. Believers are set apart. We are supposed to stand out, maybe not by hair, but by our actions. Yet we too struggle with our sinful nature. Paul talked about it in Romans. What I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I find myself doing. There's that battle with that sinful nature that we have. We too might allow ourselves to be in compromising or tempting positions. I could tell you some stories, but I won't because I, I, we don't have enough time for me to tell you some stories. But you know, we have to be careful. We need to flee from Satan, and he will flee from us. We, we need to turn away from those things that might be tempting us. We need to, to realize that we're set, about, set apart to God for a purpose. Now, it, it seems to me that Samson's troubles began when he first stepped out of obedience to his call. It was in his, his first attempt to marry a Philistine who he fell in love with at first sight. He, he saw her. She, she looked good. And he said, get her. She's my wife. Judges chapter 14 tells us that story. It says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. woman. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for, my, to, for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all your people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistine to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Verse 4, His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. That's an interesting twist. A couple things you notice there, that, that Samson did not honor his father and mother, which the Bible also commands. Get her for me. Hey, think, the, think this through, son. <laughs> That's not right. Get her. Gushing over. He didn't respect his father and mother. He didn't respect God. God knew Samson's weaknesses. God, God did not tempt Samson. God did not say, I'm going to have Samson do this. He did not orchestrate this idea of, of him falling in love at first sight, so to speak. James chapter 1 tells us, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. You've heard me say this before, I think. Billy Sunday, who was a baseball player, then an evangelist, he made the statement that, that temptation is Satan looking through the keyhole. Sin is when you open the door and you let him in. It, it, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's what you do with that temptation. So, in the process of God recognizing Samson's weakness, recognizing that Samson, again, it goes back to the foreknowledge, knowing what Samson would do, God would use his weaknesses for a pretty face to create a reason for a conflict with the Philistines. They were ruling over Israel, but nobody was doing anything about it. There was, if you will, it was occupation without stipulation. And, and God needed to stir things up a little bit. So in the process of this, this, this marriage feast, although the marriage in that case was never consummated, there's more in the scriptures about that, the process was used to, to get Samson to seek revenge over the Philistines who ruled over Israel. Yet the defeat wasn't complete. He, he, he got revenge, and God protected Samson, and God, Samson did amazing things as the Spirit of the Lord came on him and allowed him incredible victories 
in his revenge. But God protected Samson until he defied the very signs of his consecration, the things that showed people he was set apart. Samson, enticed by Delilah, who he later decided to have a tryst with, over a period of time of her begging and asking, again, this compromise situation, Samson revealed that his strength was not physical. He didn't look earth or muscle-bound. It was the Spirit of God that endowed the strength. It was, it was the sign of his connection with God that was shown by that long hair. And he told Delilah, if you shave off my hair, I lose my strength. I, I lose my connection with God. Because that was what it, it demonstrated, the connection with God. And so Delilah, as expected, betrayed Samson. And as he slept, and there's an interesting question about that. It says, when she had put him to sleep, what did she do? Did she lull him to sleep? Did she ply him with drink? We don't know. But as he slept, she shaved his head, and she called her countrymen. Judges chapter 16. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled, and, assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain. And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars to support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching. Samson performed. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two central, central pillars on which the temple stood, Bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Separated from God, the Nazarite vow removed. Samson was captured and tortured by the Philistines. They wanted revenge. His eyes were gouged out and he was chained to a mill wheel in which he would grind wain, pushing this mill wheel round and round to grind wain, rain, grain. And, and while in prison, the, the change in Samson was not that his hair grew back. Although that was a reminder of his relationship with God, the idea of being set apart, his attitude changed. Samson had lost it all. He was blinded. He was humiliated and envisioned him performing for the crowds. He was humbled. He had forgotten his purpose. It was not to get personal revenge on the Philistines. That's not what God had set him apart for. God told Samson's mother that Samson was to begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And now the Philistines were praising a false god named Dagon. Separation, God's, Samson's separation from God was over. No longer was he separated to God. It was over. We read from Numbers chapter 6, verses 13 through 15, where it said, For this is the law of the Nazarite. When the period of his separation is over, he is to be brought to the temple, to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and there he was to present his offering to the Lord, a year-old lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year-old ewe lamb without defect, and on and on. The sacrifice is required to acknowledge that the separation time was over. Revenge was still on Samson's mind. The difference now is that Samson realized that it was not about him. The, the end of his period of consecration, being set apart, was over. And now Samson would provide the greatest sacrifice he could. 
Not of a, a year old male lamb. Not of a year old ewe lamb. Samson would offer his own life. And, and in doing so, God used Samson to prove that there is no God like Jehovah God. And that Dagon is nothing. You, you can have a temple, you can have thousands of people there, but God can defeat him with a simple moving of pillars. Thus, Samson killed many more when he died than when he lived, the scripture tells us. <clears throat> the book of Judges and the life of Samson is a reminder to all of us that our sinful nature impacts our relationship with God. The, the problem then in Samson's life and, and now in our life is captured in the very last verse of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. Different translations read it different ways. I'll give you two different translations. The New American Standard wrote, reads, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The Tanakh, the Jewish translation of the scripture says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as he pleased. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, who is our king? Who, who rules over us? When we talked about Gideon some time ago, we would recognize that Gideon actually had the answer to that question. Because there was a time when Gideon did such great things that the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of the Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Does the Lord rule over you? Does the Lord rule over me? Do we let those temptations invade and take away our separation? Do we diminish that connection with God because we choose to be disobedient? The scriptures say, if I regard iniquity in my heart, you will not hear. But what he will hear is, forgive me, Lord, I have sinned. Restore unto me a, 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 a clean heart. Renew your spirit in me. Allow me to, to, to share more about what you have done in my life. Who rules over you and I? Samson gave his life in service to God. Jesus gave his life to bring us to God. The fate of Jesus, like the fate of Samson, was scary. Yet we are told the one who was equal to God, God in the flesh, according to Philippians chapter 2, did not consider equality a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore for God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Do you see Samson in yourself? Who rules over you? Jesus came to offer his life for the atonement of our sins. That when God sees us, he sees not our sin, but he sees the blood of Christ. If we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. Once a month we come together, at least once a month we come together and we remember that last supper that, that Jesus had with his disciples, the Passover meal, and how they all came together to celebrate. But Jesus used it for a bigger purpose, that he might help them understand why he came in the first place. He had been trying to teach them it all along, and now he wanted to put a bow on it. And he taught them a lot of different things about life and about service and about God. So we're going to come together as we have been doing. Come as you're ready. Take of the cup, take of the bread, take it back to your seat. 
until we all partake together. Who, who is it open to? It's open to all who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about being a member here. It's about being a member in Christ's family. Yet to those who believed him, to who those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the, what? the power to become children of God. So as the, as the ladies sing, you come, take of the bread, take of the cup, bring it back, and take time to think about your own life. What changes need to be made? Rejoice where you can rejoice. Confess what you need to confess. And prepare yourself as we take of the Last Supper communion meal together. You come down. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Say, take this bread, take this wine, now this simple may divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful, Lord we tell us that while they were eating Jesus took bread he broke it he gave thanks and he distributed it among his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is for you please now take We also learn that when the supper had ended, Jesus took of one of the cups, most likely the cup of redemption of the four cups that they would share. Jesus took the wine, gave thanks, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my body, in my blood. Do this whenever you do it in remembrance of me, his shed blood for the forgiveness of sins. Let's partake together. Almighty God, we, we, we celebrate this communion as a reminder, a reminder of your grace and your action on our behalf that you took our sins upon your shoulders that we might be in your presence. Almighty God, thank you. Help us, Lord, to remember it not just today, 
but every day of our lives. And Lord, help us to be separated to you for your glory that more might realize that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, please stand as we sing our closing song. My faithful Father Enduring friend Your tender mercies Like a river With no grace in your life? Have you watched what he does and you, and you just say, why? Why would you love me when so often I fall short? But that's God's grace. That's God's love. We can't, we can't replicate it, but we should try. The song said that all I can offer you is praise, but praise doesn't mean just coming to church on Sunday and singing. How you live your life can praise God. Your actions praise God. You're, you're revealing Christ to those around you praises God. You're, you're spending time in his word that you might know him better, that you might answer to him praises God. Let's leave this place with praise on our hearts that we might show the world the gospel. Almighty God, I thank you for each and every person here. I pray, Almighty God, that you'll bless each and every one and that, Lord, you will go with us as we go out into the world, that we might be in it but not of it, and that your grace might shine through us, that the people might want to know. Help us, almighty God, to be ready in season and out of season, to give an answer for the hope that is within us, but that we might do it with gentleness and respect. So you receive the glory. And these things we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Make sure you say hi to somebody you've never said hi to before. <laughs> There's still some drinks back there. There's still some snacks. Please enjoy. <laughs>